Yeah, everyone. It's James Davis from the Pax 8 Academy, and I've got Dave Jackson from the Ripped Orange. Thanks for joining me, Dave. Kia ora, James. How are you? Oh, good, thanks, mate. And with that intro, where, where are you based? So, based in Otatahi, Christchurch, so South Island of New Zealand. Oh, well, thanks for joining me today. I'm sure your weather's just as beautiful as tropical Hobart's. Oh, we're just looking forward to some... Well, it's winter, but we often get nice cold crisp days um, but we haven't had too many of those yet so let's hope well i'm so excited to have you you, you um we, we spoke at one of the pax 8 partner events that we threw a while ago and got so excited by what you do for a living and something close to my heart so do you want to explain a bit about what you do with training through adoption and change management yeah Sure. So, um, so I'm the managing director of a company based in Christchurch, New Zealand, called Ripped Orange. Um, we've been around for over ten years, and our focus has always been. We started off training you know, Microsoft uh, Office 2003 and earlier, um, but we've always been training on the productivity app. So nothing too technical. Our market is business users, and that market's changed over time as Office 365 or Microsoft 365 has come in with a lot of change for those users. Uh, if you think of the applications, you know, Excel, Word, etc., not a massive amount has changed for them um, over the last couple of decades. You know, pivot tables are still pivot tables. But the move to the cloud has changed a lot around collaboration, using Teams, what to use when and you know, there's been a lot of um, a lot of change a lot of confusion for that audience and so we are working on managing that change as they transition to the cloud and then actually getting value out of what they're paying for um, realizing that yes there's some features in there that may fix a problem that they've already solving somewhere else or to take advantage of those new tools and that's the wave that we're seeing now i guess most organizations are in microsoft 365 um, but they're not using everything that they've got and paying for um, uh, well, and there's certainly lots of opportunity to, when there's the right use case and there's a what's in it for them to use those tools. Well, that's really interesting because obviously I work with a, a lot of MSPs who are mm -hmm. so used to doing lift and shift projects and um, I think what you just said there around the Office 365 and the, the changes of going to the cloud and collaboration I don't think many MSPs really truly appreciate the change for the end users and the opportunity there in that space to, to, to generate some revenue. So could, could you explain a bit about how you how you go about and actually train on these kinds of topics yeah, and sure. what it looks like? So we work with a lot of partners. We don't do a lot of lift and shifts ourselves unless it's sort of a one or two, two person organisation. So normally we focus on what's the change that's happening not from a technical point of view, um, but from a what's happening to the business. So uh, my files are moving from a shared server into SharePoint. What does that look like and what do I need to do there? Um, and the other things that start to happen in that space, like file versioning, autosave, all those regular things that you start seeing with files. And, and that's fine. And it may not be the most exciting change, but it's the most impactful for a user. Um, and then you start having those discussions in some of the more advanced features where there's a fit. But our objective is to make that change as seamless as possible so that the people are happy. You know, you switch cars, you go from one car to another car, you still want the steering wheel on the right-hand side down here and you still want it to, you know, um, maybe it's switched from petrol to diesel or to electric. That's a fundamental shift that you need to understand and change, but the rest of it should be reasonably familiar Otherwise, it's not going to be the best experience when people move across. So we try and keep that simple so the business is not broken during that change. And that's a key focus. And then move forward through to the more um, advanced features. But at the end of the day, they've got to still be able to learn how to drive and get down the road and do what they did the day before. So how does, how does training actually work? I think everyone has done some form of training. But obviously, it's different to deliver, right? Yeah. Yeah. So look, it's interesting. Yeah, we've got a 13 year old boy uh, and a 19 year old uh, daughter. Now, kids learn differently to adults. 
probably not with a 13 year old boy you don't necessarily have the level of respect or, or mana that you would um, when they're a nine-year-old um, you know nine-year-old in class and in those you can stand at the front of the room you can tell them what to do you've got that respect um, as the teacher and the person at the front of the room adult training is different you've got to earn the respect and allow them to collaborate and allow them to understand what's in it for me if Johnny in, uh, in year um, six decides that he wants to leave the class because he's not interested, that's probably not going to work. But in adult training, um, yes, you've got to keep them engaged. You've got to have a reason and bring them together. And they do want to think and bring it into their scenario. So it's a different approach to training. And I break training down into two areas. One is a presentation around concepts, which is, yes, talking through, uh, but and maybe demonstrating, but talking through those concepts. And the second bit is a workshop where people actually get to practice, experiment and learn and put it into their world. So maybe I'm sharing documents, getting people to practice and understand those concepts is how people actually learn and embed that learning going going forward. Um, just like most industries, we've got our own technical terms, etc. So we call that instructional design, where we build the flow of how you learn. And if you wanted to be an all black, you would start, you can't learn to be an all black just by watching them on telly, that's not going to work, but you need to practice in steps, yeah, and and maybe you need to work through your kicking first and lots of practice in this, and you work through in slow steps as you progress your skill. Training's the same. There's no point throwing uh, all these flash new features at people first up, they'll turn off and get disheartened. If you're trying to learn how to kick, you probably start learning to kick when the ball's in front of the uh, in, in front of the goal, yeah, not from the side or anything like that. You learn um, easy and you take steps from there. Exactly the same with training. And we see that a little bit in technology training. You often lead. And we love it. We love new features that do whizzy stuff. It's all cool. So that's what you want to show off. Is that what the user first wants to master? Not really. You think about it. If you're learning to play um, play football or soccer, you know, do you teach them first how to spin the ball and curve it into the goal? Probably not. You start with the stuff that's easy, that builds the confidence of those people, and then you progress and move on from there. And training's the similar. You know, it's not, not, not difficult, but you certainly don't want to lead with the stuff that's super technical to start with for the business user audience. So from, from what you're saying around learning the fundamentals, where do you see, like with what you do, where, where do you usually start and what's usually the most popular um, fundamental that you're training? Yeah, sure. So we, we spend a lot of time focusing on how to work with documents. So how do I share, collaborate, um, synchronize, and deal with version control in a document and what's different. So that's that's a really popular training activity because it's the first thing when you move your documents to the cloud. And people you know, love this ability to be able to collaborate together. That's really, really neat. But we focus in on that area. Teams is another one um, that we spend a lot of time. And as with most organizations, you go down there, should it be a chat, should it be a channel conversation, and working through those. Um, try to look for similar areas. So most people are familiar with Facebook or WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. So bring those similarities and what they know into um, into the learnings of this new technology that they're using. May that be Teams, may that be, be whatever. Um, from there it gets interesting because that's your first step, yeah? And then it's, okay, well, there's some other features that may be of benefit to the organisation. Um, but it's getting those, you know, the what's in it for me around those. So um, one of my favourite ones that is a nice quick win is often the bookings feature in Microsoft. So Microsoft Bookings, you know, it's in there. It's not well known. Um, we still see plenty of people that use, you know, competing tools that are free or paid instead of that one. But that does a really great job of scheduling a calendar and sending somebody a link so that you don't have to play ping pong with your mail calendar back and forward with external people. So nice, simple tool. And so you find those little wins for, for people or you end up trying to um, deal with organisation change where they've got something they want to work together as a team and that then probably drives you into some of the features like planner, etc. But with all of those new features, you don't want to lead with the feature. You want to lead with the benefit for the user or the benefit for the team as a whole. Interesting. And so I'm going to go back to a, a, a term that you used a bit earlier on. 
instructional design. You, you mentioned that and it's piqued my interest. Could you explain sure. that a bit more? Yeah, so we've all got our acronym. So instructional design is the learning steps you go through. So often when we train, we will demonstrate first reasonably quickly. Actually, sorry, we will explain the concept first, demonstrate, maybe explain the concept again and do it slower and get them to follow. So you think you're trying to, um, to teach somebody how to kick a football you might explain, okay, there's the goal. It works best if you put it between the, the white posts. Um, you will, you know, put the ball down. You might explain how you how you sit it, and then it's working through and doing it once, and then getting them to do it again. So it's just going through those steps. The key thing with instructional design is also you progress how um, how difficult those steps get over time. Now, for adults, the important thing across all of this is why am I doing this? So for a kids soccer team, yeah, you can say, great, we're gonna kick the ball on the goal and that's all we, we're gonna do, okay? For adults, you wanna give them a reason on why they want to do that and it's because they're gonna become the next FIFA star or the next All Black and you know, they, they can see where it relates to where they are now. You need to bring that in because otherwise you lose the, um, uh, the desire and the connection during the training. So, and that's really important with instructional design is what is the outcome we're after? Why are these people turning up to train? And what do you want them to learn during that period of time? This is expensive, expensive for the organization. You know, taking 10, 15 people out for an hour, there's a, there's a cost there. And there's obviously a cost in the training. The cost of taking people out is usually more than the cost of the training. So you've got to be, okay, what is the purpose of this session? And that drives you know, the outcome and the training around that uh, from there. It's not to demonstrate some new features that they could potentially possibly use. That's not necessarily the best use. It's to come through at the end of this session where you will be able to do this. So when you're um, getting engaged to, mm -hmm. to do training uh, for, for clients, how are you typically engaged? Are you having to design it from scratch? Do you have programs that people choose from? How, how, how yeah, does that sure. Work? So, um, and we'll engage directly or engage via partners, but it, it, it works either way. Um, usually, there's a conversation of what you know what's happening. So, I, I try to pause and okay, what's the what's the change that's happening? How are you currently using these tools, and how is it going to impact people there? And you normally have a feel from there. Um, we've got some best practice ways to deliver training on what we think works and what we think does not work. And a lot of that is around how much content you need to include in a session. So, you know, if it's, oh, we've got half an hour and we want you to teach them everything, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be a good result for anybody. So you then to need to narrow that down. It comes back to those learning outcomes. Okay, in half an hour, what can we achieve, if anything? Um, versus other times where training needs to be successful and we talk, I talked mentioned earlier about how you bring a team together if you're doing changing so say it's um, you're bringing in a planning process and you're using Microsoft Planner or you're teaching a team to collaborate you need an owner and somebody who's passionate around driving that change and is going to be effective um, in doing so and so it depends, it might be the team leader, it might be somebody else within that group that has got respect and the ability to bring the team on. So you need that. And then, and it could be a separate person, you need somebody who's gonna champion and help the others in the technology, okay? So often, let's go back to uh, the rugby analogy, you know, the captain may not be the best player on the team, but they will lead the team. But there may be others within that team that's technically competent that can actually help the others. So you're looking for the same kind of um, scenario here as well. You And so those are your user champion, who is the person that's technically strongish, or at least has the ability to train and support the others. And then you've got your project owner or the person that's going to define and, and hold the team accountable for that change. And that could be a technology change, it could be anything. So you want to make sure you've got those um, those resources in the team. Once you've got that, then yeah, you can then develop a training program from there. Who, who have you found, like if, if I was to start looking at doing training in my MSP and I'm trying to identify someone, what sort of qualities am I looking for in a trainer? 
Yeah, sure. so patience first is the most you know is the most important, and being able to work in a people person, not necessarily the most technically competent person, because that can be learned. And remember, you you want to be able to talk to the people that are at the similar level. So technically competent can be awesome for when it's coaching, but not when it's a larger team and you're trying to structure a training environment there. So we look for, for look for those type of type of skills. Um, when we're looking for trainers, we're not usually looking for the best technical person because again that skill can be learned and and you've got a structure in your training plan anyway that you deliver to. Are those sort of people typically the ones that do the instructional design as well? Yeah, we do get an overlap between the two. So those that will design a training program are often the trainers as well. But um, in some cases, we will do train the trainer. So we'll design a nicely structured training program, deliver it once or twice, and then allow an organisation or a partner to go out and continue to spread that message. And the benefits there is, you know, we work across most industries and every industry has its own little acronyms um, that we pick up, but we're not going to pick up everything and we're not going to have the respect within each organisation because we're not out on the tools or on the forklift or in the digger. Um, so often, you know, being able to bring in and have a subject matter expert within the organisation to deliver the training is great as long as it's structured around um, that profile. The key thing with training is also it needs to be consistent. The same training for everybody when you're rolling it out. In that consistency, do you see that most organisations just want a project-based training or, or do they look to have ongoing training that, like you said, keeps stepping up and increasing yeah, productivity? Sure. No, most are project-based and that's how it's it's thought. So say, you know, I, I decide I want to get fit and go to the gym and I go to the gym three times. Am I done? No. It's unfortunately the same in technology. So you've got a project, you'll go, you need, need something to support the change, but that's only the first bit. You then need to continue to bring up the skill with the direction that the firm's going. And we don't see a large amount of that, and it's a two-way responsibility there. Yes, a partner can come in and do some of the training, but the organisation also needs to step up and develop their user champions and and others so they bring up the skill set themselves um, because that's what creates sustainable long-term adoption of any change. What do you um, what do you often find? Uh, you've said a lot of how it works and how it can, mm -hmm. can be very successful. What have you seen in your experience that um, you know, red flags have changed? Um, training or challenges or roadblocks. Yeah, sure. So we see, yeah, you know, we see a few, and we'll we'll qualify out of some stuff if we don't think it can be successful. So, you know, the first is is we just want to um, reach everybody with a quick brush over, and and we don't and we're not going to give the time for people to learn. So that's just like you know, a school class wanting to have fifty kids in it as opposed to twenty. It's not going to work. Um, and it's a bad result for the teacher and it's a bad learning outcome for the kids. Um, you also want to make sure that there is receptance and willingness for the change um, there. So if it's a, um, it's a large part of change and, and there's not buy-in across the organisation, then it's probably going to be a failure anyway. Um, so there's some internal stuff that we'll need to work through. And we've seen that with a lot of you know, ERP and CRM implementations, which are big and complex um, and really go on budget or on time. Yeah, um, they'll, they'll come in, but, um, but they're hard projects. So you, similar, similar to some Microsoft 365 transitions, not necessarily as hard, but you still need that buy-in and acceptance of there's going to be some change um, there. So we look for those um, those areas around around that. Users are pretty resilient um, in an organisation, and so often we see um, their abilities undersold um, when they are actually. You know, people are pretty resilient around change as long as they know what's happening and they've been communicated too well. So I'm finding this conversation very fascinating just listening to this i could hear a lot of opportunities um for for msps to start identifying this for for their clients how would you how would you identify the need for training yeah sure so um and this certainly is a great opportunity for msps um for a couple of areas but you know it's first okay asking that question why are they doing this change 
or when you're proposing a change from a technical point of view, which an MSP will understand why they should potentially doing it, um, including and in talking about the change on the users uh, that will go through. Not necessarily, and you maybe you choose to present this as well, the technical benefits of this wonderful magic box that you're installing now, but it's the, the change for the users and how that's going to impact them both there'll be some negative and some positive. So there'll be some negative up front because change is something people are going to have to do and they may not like to do it. But once you've put an MFA and done all this other stuff, there'll be some benefits for the users, yeah? Um, so that so that's important to work through. From an MSP's point of view, if you've got a change project and you're fixed priced it or it's part of your um, standard MMR on, um, on services, once you're through the change, you want people to be able to use it well, because if you suddenly find your call rates spike up hugely, that's going to be on you if you've got a fixed price um, service agreement. And if it's the same question every time, how do I do this, then maybe tackling that with change, bringing in some user champions and upfronting it will mean that that project is going to be more profitable for the MSP. And so that's a tick. It also means the client will be happier and stickier as well. So you've got two really good positives there from MSP um, when they're dealing with projects. And we certainly see that when we work with, with clients uh, or partners in that space. So I, I agree. I think there's a huge opportunity for MSPs to tap into this and from my experience, all organisations want their people trained up and to be as productive as possible. Um, it, but I'm very curious from your perspective if like the delivery methods of training, like you, you've obviously done a lot of different things, what, what works, what doesn't. Um, sure. So cast back to, you were know, talking about instructional design and the learning objective. So that's really important because that defines what you're going to cover the objectives of that and how long it would take will float through from there from what you're going to cover and also it starts to cover the method of delivery okay so if I'm going to learn how to kick a ball I'm probably going to need to be in a field and kicking a ball and practice on that space if I'm going to learn concepts of how stuff is there then yeah maybe a video an e-learning product or a presentation will do that so Thinking about the concepts from there, now methods of delivery have changed with COVID obviously. Um, we've got, used to have a fleet of laptops and we would gather them all on the plane and, and take them to a place and turn up and set up a classroom and train in that space. And we still do that and that's really good um, for some scenarios. But um, we can also deliver, uh, as in most training companies can deliver virtually now. And that opens up couple of positives. One is that you can have shorter sessions, it makes commercial sense. Um, and shorter sessions actually align with people's learning behaviour. You know, uh, I fundamentally don't believe that a full day class is the best result. Uh, and most people a half day is, is about a good learning chunk for people to learn and also not disrupt the business too much. Um, so virtual allows you to jump in and do that wherever those people are. So we work across Australia, New Zealand training um, virtually, and that works really well. In the past, pre-COVID, we'd have probably been getting on planes all the time. You mentioned e-learning. Mm -hmm. um, so from your experience, what is it good for and how do you actually properly utilise it? Sure. So let's come back to adult learning again and the theories around there and why am I doing this? what's in it for me and often adult learnings want to come back and forward and have those discussions to work out what's in it for me what's in it for me and how do I apply this learning to my organization so I don't know you take planner you explain what it can do oh great I now understand I can apply and I've made those linkages e-learning is good for learning a specific task so great for cybersecurity training okay what does this look like is it is it um, fake or real, yes, no, answer your questions from there. That's great. Is e-learning good for discussing collaboration concepts and how a team's going to work together? Probably not because you need to have a couple of other people to collaborate when you do it. So e-learning is a great tool for some things. Good for technical learning. I need to understand the flow from there as long as you practice it from there. 
Um, I think the thing to be careful with e-learning is you've got to save the time to do it. Okay, and in making that time within business, that's normally the hardest thing, regardless of whether it's in-person training or e-learning. Um, getting people to take the time to actually spend the time on that e-learning course and out of their diary with the other distractions is, is hard. And and so, so so you need to think around the length and style of that course um, to get successful adoption and successful learning outcomes from the course, which is what I understand. So for things like um, cybersecurity training, great, because you can come through, look at it and answer a quiz and you've got that measure that did people pass or not. For something that's more collaborative, maybe that's not the outcome, but come back to your learning objectives at the start. Uh, some really good advice because I see MSPs just buying e-learning tools, dumping it in and then wondering why the they're not getting much uptake from the from the end users in their yep. clients, and I think you explained that very it, well. It's, it's not as um, it's not as addictive as binging the latest session on on Netflix, is it? You know, you're not you're not necessarily going to sit down and go, "Oh, that was a great session." I'm going to, and five hours later, you're you're still going through them. Maybe, but but I suspect not. <laughs> I, from my experience, not, um, and I think. I've heard someone say that e-learning is very good for compliance training, that you can track that people have done it, yep. or it's a good point in time, I've got a problem to solve, here's a video to solve my problem, yeah, rather that's than great. what you're describing. I think the problem one's interesting because we also find users that don't understand they've got a problem, or know they've got a problem but don't understand there's a solution to that problem. So imagine they've never heard of a pivot table before it. They're not going to know that, but they're going to, it's getting to that concept first. And then, yeah, absolutely, e-learning is useful to come back in and technically reinforce that training while they're on the go. But being able to do the, um, the um, being able to bridge that initial solution at the start is really important. So if I was to be starting up training, uh, I'm looking now, I've been listening as an MSP owner to this this session and I see there's a lot of opportunity to help my clients and make money. How do I even get started with this sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of ways you can get started. Um, obviously, you can choose to you know partner with a training partner who can deliver deliver those courses and that's one and that, that's a great way. The advantage that a training partner will bring is they've already written out that instructional design so they've already got the content there so it's really just configuring on the margins from there. Um, but you can certainly build out your own content. One of the areas that I that we're, we quite like is Microsoft Learning Pathways and so I'd encourage MSPs to look at that. The way to think about that is it embeds within a client's SharePoint site a private YouTube channel of content. Now that means that you can configure what the client staff has access to. So if you haven't um, deployed Yammer or Viva Engage, I think it is this week, then you can um, turn that off so it's not visible. So you can start to build up, and it's it's a free tool from Microsoft that provisions as a SharePoint site. So that solves the um, where do I go to learn things. What it doesn't solve is the what's the major the adoption plan and how we're going to structure this training over a period of time, um, and that takes a lot of experience in how you structure and build training for the people. But if you've got the resources internally, then that's a that's a really good place to start. That's some great advice, and it twigged my it twigged my brain of where is typically the best for the um, end users to access their learning is it in their existing systems or is it an external lms like what's what's your experience being? yeah and our experience so they will go to google and youtube first yep we we, we, we get that they may even go to bing or, or ai bing down the down the um down the track so they'll go to those places for a specific problem how do i do this okay but that's not necessarily guided learning and practice that's solving problems in the flow of work LMS is really good for, as you, as you mentioned correctly earlier, for compliance-based training, or I need to go through this step. And you've, you, know, you may have a large volume of people, and you go, great, we're moving 10,000 people to the cloud, and we want you to do these modules, and, and that's the, the, the way to do it. But 
um, behind that, you'll have also have some user champions and other other areas. Um, so there's certainly different ways you can do it. It's a blend. That's how we learn. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we find really successful <coughs> is setting up either a Yammer community or a Teams channel. Take your pick of your of your of your flavour there, and that's a place where people can post and ask questions. Because how you know how do we learn how to do something? We might Google it. We might um, do a course potentially, but we'll probably definitely ask somebody else within our peer group or network on how we do it. And that's probably where we start first. Oh, how do I do this? And they may say, oh, well, if you're going to need to spend a fair bit of time learning that, do this, do this course or do whatever, or here's some quick pointers to get you started. Um, what they won't do there is necessarily ring the MSP's help desk. So it starts to um, create that community within the organisation, which is great, and then MSPs can come in and look at those, just like service tickets, and go, okay, how do I do this? I'm not sure how many service tickets ar arrive for how do I do a pivot table. Not as many as they used to, but that probably <coughs> reflects um, reflects the challenge that MSPs have is our values changing. So if they're not coming to ask us that sort of thing, we're sort of being shut out in a lot of ways, good, good and bad. Yep. But we... Yeah, and that's a good point. You don't need to be an expert in everything, but the high level stuff. So we do some Power BI training, but really at just a business user level. As you know, once you get a bit further in that, it just falls off into a cliff, into technical stuff that gets really, really complex. But you can start that conversation, and that's a great spot for an MSP because then you're leading the discussion around it and and then maybe you don't need to learn the the full technical detail but you're across the business benefits and why they would use it and maybe a little bit to start with and then you can partner in with a power bi guru to do the last bit but you're driving the business discussion with your clients so wrapping up this has been a fantastic you know, fantastic conversation how do, how do you monetize this kind of thing yeah so training is an interesting one to monetize um, obviously in um, in courses and the IP around that so that's the same as a, a, as an MSP approach it's the IP that you bring to designing really good courses that people like the flow through so that's that's fine um, so that's usually how we monetize that and that then comes through to a course or a, um, a delivery option around how we deliver that you've also got to be prepared to give some stuff away for free because you've got to learn a little bit before you learn more if that makes sense so offering some you know knowledge around how do I do something to get people interested and see actually in that first step of okay now I know enough I actually want to learn more on how to use this tool and we see that with MSPs doing events and seminars on stuff but it's usually feature-led to a degree but maybe it's more okay let's talk from a, a business perspective around this and actually let's give away a little bit more IP around how we do this so we can drive from there. That's, that's some awesome advice and I'd love to have you back in the future this is a topic that I'm super passionate about obviously and doing what I do so wrap up, what's what's the main takeaway that you, you want people to, to walk away with and what, what are some next action points that you give people to think about? Sure, so I think for an MSP, if you're driving a project, you need to think about the change in that. And when you're positioning that project, a budget line needs to come in there for training and adoption. And think of it, you know, think of it like cyber insurance, and insurance to make sure that the project works well. And, and so the benefits there are a happier client and potentially a more profitable project without lots of calls afterwards. So positioning it up front at the start of the project is good. And when you're working with that budget, you know, taking, taking training out and throwing in more technology, maybe that's not the best option. Trying to drive that because you're looking at the business goals and the outcomes from there. So that's, that's the first, first place to start. And then from there, making you know, decisions whether you partner or whether you build yourself, and that, that's going to be a decision that each MSP owner is going to work through. Well, so there's some great golden nuggets, and I, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Dave. So thank you so much for Perfect. joining us, and look forward to it next time. Great. Thanks, James. Cheers. Thank you.